Hey United, welcome to our online gathering. I'm Lorianne, I'm a member of the team here and we are just so grateful for um, all of us that are able to come together here um, online and learn more about uh, God and his word together. Um, this week, if you can go to the check-in tab on the website, um, you can let us know that you and your family are watching. It's also a great place to put a prayer request um, or a question you have or, or a next step that you want to take. Um, so if you can go ahead and head over there and check in, that's awesome. That way we know you are here. Um, and then one thing that we're really excited that's coming up is a starting point and starting point is a really great way to um, just get to meet some of the team here, get to meet other folks that are new to United, get to share a meal together, ask questions and just learn more about what it looks like um, to follow God. That's coming up on Tuesday, April 20th at 630. So we hope to see you there. Again, that's something that you can put when you check in. You can go ahead and put that you're interested in coming out to start point dinner. This week, um, we have another really interesting story to hear. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, we started hearing from um, Dave Black, who's a part of our church community here, and he's sharing stories of the persecuted church. And um, one of the things that we know about the church um, from the very early days when Jesus was still on this earth here with us um, is that he told his disciples that the world would hate them because of him. And so he told them that, you know, life following him wasn't going to be easy. And there are stories um, from all around the globe of churches um, and people that are being persecuted for their faith in Jesus. And um, we want to be encouraged by their stories and challenged by their stories. Um, and we also want to pray for them. Um, we want to pray that um, God's hand will be on them. And so we're um, excited this week to hear another one of those stories. And I just encourage you to uh, reflect on it again and ask how you can be challenged by the boldness of these people and how much um, they've just completely committed their lives to Christ. Um, and I'd also challenge you to, to pray for them. Um, these are our brothers and sisters around the globe, and we just want to lift them up in prayer as well. So go ahead and check this out. Hi United, my name is Dave Black and I'm here to tell you once again about a story of the persecuted church. Today I want to tell you about a woman, her name is Hajaratu, and she's from Nigeria. Now Nigeria is a country on the west coast of Africa and it has a population of approximately 206 million people. In Nigeria there are cities and within the cities there is a very active a social scene, a modern culture, there are museums, there's sports, there's theater, there's arts. But I'm not going to talk about uh, one of the cities. I want to talk to you about one of the villages. Now, Nigeria is made up of 50% Christians and 50% Muslims. And in this small village, of Chibab, which is about in the center of the country. I want, I want to tell you about a, a woman, Hajaratu, who lives there, and this is a, a, a small agricultural village. They, they make their money mostly, their sustenance mostly on growing corn, and they have some livestock. Now the dirt road to Chabab is like a burnt sienna color and it's filled with potholes, so it's a very precarious uh, drive in order to get there. But the town is surrounded by uh, cornfields and then beyond the cornfields, there's the darker forest. Now Hadratu's husband, his name was David Matthew and he died in 2019 due to an illness. He left Hadratu with five children, four older children and a baby daughter. On July 10th, in, on uh, 2020, Hadratu had put her children to bed and she was starting to settle down and fall asleep by the fire in her home. All of a sudden she wakes up and there's a lot of noise and commotion in the village. She can hear gunfire, she can hear people yelling, she can hear people running past her, her house, and she realizes 
that the Fulani Muslim extremists are attacking their village. Now, the Fulani extremists have been attacking a lot of Christian villages and also Christian churches. So this was kind of their time to be attacked. So in the midst of this turmoil, she, she runs in and, and wakes up her children, her older children, and she tells them to run with the neighbors. Uh, just get yourself together, run with them, I will find you later. Then she goes and she gets her baby and she takes her baby and she straps her baby to her back using a piece of fabric and she runs out the door. Everybody is running from the village. They're trying to make their way to the forest and Hajaratu stumbles and falls in the cornfield. Of course, everybody else is still running, but she has to get herself back up. And the baby is crying. There's gunfire behind and she can hear yelling behind her and she makes it through the through the cornfield she makes it to the forest and as she gets into the forest the rest of the people from her village are now further and further ahead of her and she yells to them to slow down but they uh, don't hear her finally she gets to the river now she's not terribly concerned even though she doesn't know how to swim the river isn't really deep but they've been having a lot of rains recently so the river is moving very fast. She's a little concerned, but she doesn't like what's behind her. So she's moving into the river and she can see people ahead of her on the other side of the river and they're moving further away and she needs to be with them. So she moves out into the river. And when she gets about to the center of the river, the fast moving water wipes her right off her feet. And she goes down and she gets up. She's a little panicked and she's, she's spitting water out and trying to yell to people to wait. And once again, a second time, she's, she's knocked off her feet by the fast moving water. And then a third time she's knocked off her feet. When she finally makes it to the other side of the river, she realizes that her baby is gone, that her baby has been washed from her back along with the, the fabric that had been holding the baby. She starts to cry and to yell out and she's walking up and down the river at nighttime trying to find her baby. Well, eventually a man hears her and comes to help her. And this man gets her to go to his home where his wife starts to care for her and starts to bandage her, her wounds. And they pray with her and they give her something to drink. The next day, Hadratu with this man and this woman, they go back to the village of Chabab. And as they go back to the village, they see that some of her neighbors ha are, are laying dead in the street. The houses have been burnt and uh, any livestock that they had, chickens or, or whatever, anything is, has been stolen and there is nothing there. So the man takes Hadratu and some other survivors that have made it back to Chabab, they all go together to a displaced person's camp. Now this is a camp that has been established by a pastor. And what he has there at this camp is not only he has some nurses and some doctors that work at this camp, but he also has supplies of food. He also has new clothing that, that these people, displaced people can, can wear. And he also has mattresses that they can sleep on. So Hadratu makes it to this camp and people take care of her. They, they weep with her. They, they pray with her. They try to minister to her with God's word. She's there for three days. And finally, her older children, her four older children are returned to her. They make it to the camp as well. And when they come up to her, they ask her about their baby sister. And she tells them that what had happened to their baby sister. And the entire family cries together. Now the loss that Hajaratu experienced rattled her faith. And she said, I question God, why did he permit all these deaths to happen in Chabab and especially in my family? 
She didn't receive any clear answers, but she says she felt God saying that it was the set time for those who died to depart this world. For now, this is what Hadaratu holds to, a deep trust in God's purpose and timing that we'll never completely understand in this world. Hadaratu has since returned to Chabab with her family. She continues to wrestle with the loss of her young daughter, but she's finally beginning to find hope, to see the light again. Hadratu teaches her children about the love of Jesus, the love of God, and she teaches them to sing these words in a song. Only words of gratitude, only words of gratitude. There is nothing I have to offer you, my God, except words of gratitude. Now, the lesson that I personally get from this, actually there's two. The first lesson is the amazing faith that this woman has, that she can go through this and still be grateful to God for what he's done for her. Now, the second lesson that I get from this are the other Christians that are there to help. And it makes me think, if I'm just aware, if my eyes are open, how can God use me to help somebody else? Hey everybody, we're glad you're here today. My name's Jerry, I'm one of the guys on staff here at United Church, so glad you're joining us online. And I wanna ask you a question, as the weather's getting warmer and we're approaching the summertime, do you like going to the beach? So if you're watching online, lean over to somebody next to you and say, hey, I love going to the beach or I don't love going to the beach. Tell them how you feel about it. Uh, I, I even had like a kind of a dilemma because I grew up in New Jersey and we didn't call the beach the beach. We called the beach the shore. So we would say we're going to the shore. And then when I got to Maryland a couple of times, I mentioned to people like, hey, I went to the shore. And they're like, what's the shore? And so, uh, so we had this kind of like little argument about what are you supposed to call this thing that you go to with a big body of sand and water and stuff. And so we would call it the beach. And uh, so my parents bought a house in the 1980s in Cape May, New Jersey, which is the very bottom, the very bottom of the armpit of USA in uh, New Jersey. I'm only saying that for the benefit of people that heard our lead pastor, Tim, once referred to New Jersey as being the armpit of America, which I do not agree with. I love New Jersey. And so my parents bought a shore house down there. And so I was accustomed to being down there for many summers as I was in high school. And me and my sisters would love to go out and go in the ocean and so we would go out there swimming at times would be on rafts or whatever or floating duckies or some other nonsense and we would be out there in the ocean and enjoying it and then weird things started to happen when we were out there i know at times i was out there and i would be looking back on the beach and i'd be like where did everybody and everything go I'm looking and I'm like, why did my family desert me? I'm having like anxiety and separation problems because I'm like, my family deserted me. And then I, as I look down the shore line, I'm like, there they are. They're 100 yards down this way away from me. And I'm like, why would you pick up all your stuff and go like 100 yards down this way? And I realize, oh, no, that's not what's happening. I'm actually moving. I'm moving in the water. And, uh, and so we started to realize that even in the modest of conditions when you're out in the ocean, 
you are being moved around. There are strong forces upon you that are pressing against you and skirting you left and right and sometimes outward. And that's what happens at when you're in the ocean and swimming. And so I feel like people tend to underestimate the power of this constant pressing of the ocean against them. And I think for, for us as people who have um, are trying to follow Jesus and know him, there's a presupposition in all of us, or if not all of us, most of us, that we believe that if I'm not actively walking away from my walk with Jesus, that I'm doing just fine. So if I'm not like just actively sinning against him and running away from him, that I'm in this kind of neutral place and I'm in the same place that I was a week or a month or a year ago. And this is a very interesting idea. It's a fine idea, except, for the, except uh, in the sense that it's completely and totally wrong. There is no neutral ground when we're trying to follow Jesus. There is no neutral ground that we can just assume that we stay in. And so I want to like, I want to have us repeat um, this kind of phrase a few times this morning so we get it into our heads and we remember it. And this is what I want you to remember. I want you to say, I drift by default. So if you're sitting next to someone right now, you can elbow them and you can look at them and say, I drift by default. And we've been working through the Bible in a year series, and we've been challenged to be growing and spending time in God's word. And, and, when, and when we say that, I, this is what I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you're hearing clearly. We're encouraging people in this time to be actually reading the Bible on their own. This is not reading a devotional, though they can be helpful at times. This is not listening to other people's sermons, though that can be helpful at times. But we are sitting down actively looking at our Bible, maybe even a paper Bible, if you guys even have such a thing anymore, but having a Bible of some sort in front of us, and we're like, God, I want you to teach me. And why do we want people to be doing this? Because we drift by default. And the Bible is part of the way that anchors us into a godly walk with Jesus because it helps us know where we're supposed to be at all times. And so this morning, or, the, or today, we're going to be looking at the life of King Solomon. We're going to see up close and personal how his life was compromised because of the drift that he had from the Lord. And so I'm going to give you just a little history recap just so we remember where we're at. So if you've been tracking along, um, the Israelites came out of Egypt and Moses led them out. They go out into the promised land. And then at the end of the book of uh, Joshua, they're settled in the land of Canaan. 400 years go by. This is the time of the judges. And at the end of the time of the judges, the Israelites get this great bright idea that they're going to say, we want a king. And this is something that God did not want them to have. This is something that Samuel pressed back against when they were asking Samuel for a king. He was like, you don't want a king. They're going to take your sons into war. They're going to tax you. They're going to make you do things. Don't do this. And God in the end said, you know what, Samuel, let them have their king because they're not rejecting you, but they're rejecting me. And so then we get the first king who's Saul, and Saul is like, he is the guy that everyone looks to and says, this is a great guy. He's like kind of, I, I, when I visualize this, this is Dwayne The Rock Johnson. This is a guy who looks awesome and is going to be an awesome leader. And, um, and he plays that part, but he's not a good king. He's compromised. He fails. He ends up killing himself on the battlefield. He dies tragically. And um, this is not a great thing for the uh, nation of Israel. And so we get our second king at that point. God appoints a new king, and this man is named David. And he is known as a man after God's own heart, but he's also a flawed leader. He commits adultery, has one of his close friends killed so he can, um, so he can get their wife. He ends up uh, calling for a giant census, which is basically like, I want to count everybody in my army. And um, it's a big pride move, and, and he, knew, uh, he knew this this was wrong, and God judged him, and thousands of people died as a result of that. He had a couple children, a couple guys that tried to usurp him off his throne, and he just had trouble, um, though he was known as, as a man after God's own heart. And so he eventually has this son that we're going to talk about today named Solomon, and Solomon is actually the, the, the child of of David, David and Bathsheba, and Bathsheba was the person that he committed adultery with. And so 
So Solomon ends up taking the throne. He has his own little private security force led by a guy named Benaniah, who is his own personal John Wick, and he sends him off to go take care of a few of David's enemies, and then off we go, and now Solomon then starts off as the third king of Israel. And so I'm going to quickly move through. We're going to cover like 11 chapters here of first kings and the first 10 chapters i'm just going to paraphrase a little bit so you get some of the context because it does matter but here's how in in the second chapter of kings this is how things begin here david is old and and he's about to pass away and he's trying to pass some wisdom on that he's learned in his walk with god and he's trying to implore solomon to follow the way he should and so he sends, says this in verse two he says i'm about to go the way of all the earth. So be strong, act like a man, and observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in obedience to him and keep his decrees and commands, his laws and regulations as written in the law of Moses. Do this so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go, and the Lord may keep his promise to me. Quote, if your descendants watch how they live and if they walk faithfully before me, with all their heart and soul, you will never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. And so this is David kind of like trying to set him up for success. And so early on in, uh, in this chapter, we learn that Solomon made an alliance with Egypt and he marries the Pharaoh's daughter. And, um, and these kings did this kind of thing a lot where they would marry into another kingdom so that these guys would end up having to trust each other. And, and this is a problem. He's, this is not starting off well for Solomon. Uh, we also learned that he ends up offering sacrifices and burnt incest on the high places. And we'll get to that in a little bit. Why does that, imp- why does that matter? But here's what you need to know right now. From the beginning, from the beginning, Solomon is drifting and he's compromising. And why is he doing that? Because we drift by default. And so God ends up coming to uh, Solomon, it appears to him in a dream, and he says, hey, I'm so pleased with you. I just want you to ask, ask for whatever you want. And so Solomon basically says, he goes, look, I know this is a huge kingdom. This is a huge job. I don't know what I'm doing. And so please give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. And God loves this prayer. And he says, you know, because you asked for this and you just didn't ask for your enemies to get, uh, to get uh, destroyed and you didn't ask for riches and wealth and fame, I'm going to give you wisdom like nobody else has had and, and I'm also going to give you these other things as well. And so God's really pleased with this. Now, the, here's an interesting side note to this whole idea. You know, I feel like a lot of times in our Christian walk, we're like, if God would just appear to me and just tell me straight to my face or have an audible conversation with me, I would follow him and I wouldn't have any trouble after that. Well, we're going to learn and here you see it and you also see there's a second time that God appears to Solomon. It didn't fix this problem. Solomon still drifted, even though God like met with him personally, it didn't stop Solomon from drifting. And why is that? Because we tend to drift by default. And so, so Solomon is now uh, running with the kingdom. He's becoming, he's very wealthy. He, he inherited a lot of wealth from David after his conquering of other nations. And then everything that Solomon's doing is prospering at. This guy is a great leader of the nation. The whole nation is experiencing his good leadership. And then we see later on this admonition from God as well. He says, hey, If you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. What are we noticing? God, again, is warning Solomon. And so so then we get further along in a couple chapters, and here is Solomon now. He's building the first temple uh, to God, and this temple stood from the 10th century B.C. until King Nebuchadnezzar destroyed it in the 6th century B.C., and so Solomon's putting a lot of time and work into this, into this temple, seven years. And then he takes 13 years to build his palace. And it's kind of an interesting idea here, an interesting question. Why is Solomon spending almost twice as much time on his own personal kingdom than actually building up the temple of God? And so it makes you wonder, is this another little sign that, hey, he is drifting? 
And, um, and so we get to chapter 8, and then here Solomon is dedicating the temple, uh, the temple to God, and he's saying, like, he has this great prayer, and he says, hey, if, uh, Lord, please listen to your people when they come in this temple and they cry out to you and they ask for help, please listen to them. And it's great, and it's a wonderful, wonderful prayer. And then there's a big celebration where they sacrifice 22,000 cattle and 120,000 sheep, and so basically, and sheep and goats, and, and basically Solomon's trying to dedicate this temple to God, and they're trying to, you know, just set everything up well. But we get to chapter 9, and lo and behold, here comes another thing from the Lord. He says, as for you, if you walk before me faithfully with integrity of heart and uprightness, as David your father did, and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne forever, as I promised David your father when I said, you shall never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. He goes on here and says in verse 6, But if your descendants turn away from me and do not observe the commands and decrees I have given you and go off to serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land I have given them and will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. And Israel will become a byword, an object of ridicule. And so basically, he's basically saying, hey, if you guys run off and you worship other gods, I'm going to let these bad things happen to the nation of Israel. And why is God saying this? Because he knows that we drift by default. He knows this. And it's almost like God knows the future. Uh, go figure. And so he knows what's going to happen, and he's still warning Solomon. He says, I don't want this to happen to you guys, but it's important that you follow me. And so that's how we get to chapter 11. And so here we land in chapter 11 in the beginning, and we're going to learn a little bit more about Solomon and his drift. And this is what we learn in the beginning of chapter 11. It says, King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. He loved the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from the nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after other gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led, them, or led him astray. So one of the things we see here is that Solomon is already drifting by, by having all these wives uh, with him. This is not prescribed in the Old Testament. This was not God's original plan. He did not want this. Um, and I know a lot of us might be tempted to insert our, our own our joke in here, like, isn't one wife enough? I won't make such a crass joke. But he has a thousand wives to keep him busy. And why is he doing this? Well, he's doing this, one, to build alliances and stuff. But this is not God's desire for him. And then we learn later in verse 4, as Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had done. And so just to give us a little bit of context about what this means here, uh, what, what is this worship? So Asherah was, uh, the, uh, was one of these goddesses that, that people worshipped, and it was kind of associated with tree worship or forest worship. And when people practiced this, they, this included sexual immorality, included prostitution, divination, and fortune-telling. And even in the Mosaic Law, it was, there, was a, for, there was a passage that specifically said, do not worship this god. And so this was not a good thing at all. And then when we learn about Moloch, what was Moloch? Moloch was the chief god of the Ammonites. And this god was known for perverted cruelty. And he was most honored by human sacrifice. And so people would actually burn their children in fire for this god. And that they would also let infants pass through fire as a form of dedication. And... Uh, and so actually, if you find a picture of Moloch, 
Um, it was a, it's a picture, it's illustrated of the, the head of a bull and arms outstretched as a representation of him receiving children to be sacrificed. And, uh, and this is just a terrible, awful, evil thing to be involved with. Uh, awful thing. There's um, also mention of this god, Chemosh, which was known as a fish god, and he was the national deity of the Moabites and the Ammonites. And in the days of um, King, uh, one of the kings, Judas king, uh, Jehoram, Je Jehoram uh, somebody actually sacrificed their son uh, on the city wall for this god. And so this is just awful, awful stuff that Solomon got himself into. And so we might be wondering, like, well, I don't know, like, what's, okay, I, I think that sounds bad. Um, what is the big deal about idolatry? What's the big deal about idol worship? Well, here's what the big deal is. Idolatry is about the idea of exchanging God for something that's not God. So we exchange our worship for God for something that is not God. Even Paul mentions this, uh, the Apostle Paul, in the book of Romans, he mentions that, that people will exchange the truth of God for a lie and follow other false gods. And when God spoke about this, all in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, he would speak as if he was a wronged party in a marriage. He would be saying things like, you're cheating on me. So he would use terms like adultery. And sometimes he would use these very graphic images of uh, people committing sexual uh, immorality on the top of a mountain. And he would talk about it like, you're personally hurting me. You're running away from me. You're abandoning me. And why, so what's so bad about adul adultery, I mean, uh, idolatry, is that it is an abandoning a relationship with a person. That's how God viewed it. And that's why he was so against this. And so this was really bad for Solomon to be drifting in these ways. And so, so I think so for some of us might be like, well, you know, like this is kind of what people did in the, in the old days. We don't tend to do that today. We don't really worship um, other gods. You know, I'm not really sure what this has to do with me today. So, so I would ask this question. Are you sure that we don't do any of this today? Maybe our idols are actually a little bit more personal and a little bit more um, silent in the sense that people don't know exactly what we're doing. So, so I have a couple questions for you that might help turf up, hey, like, do I have any of these idolatrous things that go on in my heart? And so here's a couple questions that we can ask ourselves. What can't I live without? So what can't I live without? When I get up in the morning, what am I reaching for? What's the thing that's pulling me in the morning, what do, and what do I, when I get out of bed, what am I living for every day? What excites me? What's got my attention? Or kind of like, what, where do my affections lie? Think of it this way. What do you write about on your social media? What you write about your social media is probably what you're most excited about. Or what do you tend to talk about with your friends, or your family, your spouse? That is probably the thing or things that you're most excited about. And if in, in, and if Jesus is not the answer to these questions, you probably have sometimes and some struggles in your heart of idolatry. And, uh, and so some of our idols may end up looking like things that are just kind of like normal, but, like, but can actually take the place of God. How about things like this? How about pleasure or comfort? How about pride or self-sufficiency? Do I... Do I run after people thinking that I've pulled myself up by my own bootstraps and I'm a self-made person? Uh, how about the approval of others? Does that rule you, what people think about you? This is what the Bible would call the fear of man. And so does the approval of others, does that control you at times? How about the love of a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a spouse? Do, do you need that in order to live every day? Or how about things like security, like financial security, uh, 401ks and things like that? What about health? Uh, certainly COVID has made us start thinking about things like this. Like, hey, like how am I going to stay alive? And, uh, and it can be real tempting to be the center of our universe can be, I need to make sure that I stay alive. And this can become an idol. Or how about high standards or excellence or high standards for yourself or even other people? 
And finally, I think just one, probably one big catch-all for all of us, especially as Americans, would be this. I just live for myself. Have you seen this on maybe social media or some, reading somewhere? Hey, live your best life now. Or, or the idea of like follow your heart. I know Tim mentioned that one time when he was talking about um, relationships. Hey, we, you know, people are tempted to just follow your heart. These are terrible ideas. There's no other way to say it. Like living your best life now is not a Jesus-following Christian idea. It's a selfish way to think about life. And so these are the things that can become idols for us. So, so before we become all self-righteous and, and we want to cancel Solomon and throw him under the bus and all that, and how could this guy be like that? Maybe we're a lot like him and we just don't know that. And so I know at times these, some of these things can control me in ways that cause me to drift away from the Lord. So what's the theme that we see in this beginning part of the passage from Solomon? We see this. Who we surround ourselves with makes a huge difference in how well we follow God. Who we surround ourselves with makes a huge difference in how well we follow God. The Apostle Paul talks about this in, in the book of Corinthians. He says, don't be misled. Bad, character, bad company corrupts good character. Who we surround ourselves with is going to be a huge influence on whether we're following Jesus or not. Now, we can have all kinds of relationships. We can have relationships where we're influencing people more than they're influencing us. But make no mistake about it, the relationships that we put around us are going to have a huge impact on our lives. And part of those relationships should be helping us grow in our walk with Jesus. So the people that are in your inner circle, are they there not only to come alongside and help encourage you and, and help you press on, or are, are they also there to help challenge you and admonish you when necessary? Do you have people in your life like that? Can you actually name them? It's one thing to be like, yeah, I have people like that. Okay. Can you name them? Who's the person in your life that's getting up in your grill at times and be like, hey, Jerry, I don't think this is right. I don't think you should be thinking like this. I don't think you should be doing this. Who is that person or persons? Much drift in our lives comes from having the wrong people around us or a lack of the right people around us or a combination of both. So here's a good gauge if you're trying to figure out, like, how am I being influenced? Um, a valuable friend in Christ will be challenging you. And in order for us to have that kind of friend in our life, we need to invite them in and we need to give them permission to speak into our lives. So we need to be able to say things like, hey, can you check up on me? I don't know if, you know, I'm, I've been kind of slacking in my walk with God. Can you check in on me? Can you ask me what I'm watching on TV or watching online? Can you ask me how I'm doing with my spouse? Um, and, and, and just this idea of knowing that I drift by default. And so inviting other people to come in and help us in that pursuit. And those people should have a profound impact on your life. When we start thinking like this, it's going to change who we surround ourselves with, who we date, who because those are our closest relationships, who we marry, a super close relationship. And so we need people around us that are not only going to be our buddies and our friends, but they're also going to challenge us and propel us on to follow Jesus when we're, when we're drifting and falling away. I think one of the big lies that the world has given to us over the last year and we've been discipled in is that church is no longer necessary. Church has been reduced down to it's a TV show now. And this is what society has told us. You don't, we don't need to be open. We don't need to be doing anything. We don't need to be uh, discipling people. Just turn on uh, something on TV and watch it. And that's all that you need. And this is what we've been discipled in for a year. And it's terrible. We need people in our lives up close and personal to help us grow in our walk with God. I know with me, I've been, a, I've been a beneficiary of some godly guys that have spoken in my life over the years. I remember uh, a guy that I met in a small group that I actually developed a really good friendship with, my friend Brian, and uh, our firstborn son, Derek, was pretty young. I think he was like maybe four or five. We were talking about, um, we were talking about school and stuff, and so, and Debbie and I had grown up in the public school system, and we, were, we loved the public school system. It was great for us. And so this guy, Brian, who I didn't know super well, I was just starting to get to know, he said, hey, how, um, what are you thinking about with regards to school for Derek? And I, I gave him the answer that 
um, we had told everybody, like, hey, we're going to put him in public school. He said, oh. He said, well, um, why are you doing that? I'm like, well, you know, we, you know, we think the, school, you know, the school's got a good reputation and it's going to be good and all that. And, and he's like, well, what do you want to accomplish by him being in public school? And, and ultimately, what do you want him to do for God in public school? And I'm like, oh, well, I want him to, you know, love people and share the gospel with his friends and have an impact on them. And, and uh, he's like, oh, he goes, do you think he's capable of doing that at five, six, and seven? And I was like, well, no. I'm like, not really reading his Bible a whole lot yet, you know? And, um, and so I realized, like, we hadn't put any thought into this. We had just kind of gone along with what everyone does and uh, so we're like, wow, we need to actually start thinking and praying about this. And so Debbie and I started then researching and we went to different symposiums where people talked about public school, private school, Catholic school, all that was really good. And at the end of that, we realized like, hey, you know what? We want to have the biggest impact on our children. And so we should homeschool them. And so we did a 180 on this. And our view of homeschooling was not good at that time in our lives. The only homeschoolers we knew were like really socially crippled. And we were like, I don't want my kids to be like that. And just, we didn't have a good view of, of um, homeschooling. And, uh, but I am super grateful that Brian took a risk to talk to me. And, um, and that had a huge impact on our lives. And I'm not saying this is an infomercial for, for homeschooling. People, people need to do what they believe is best. I know for us, we just didn't give any thought to it. That's my point in sharing this. Like we just were kind of going along with the crowd and that was not good. And so I'm thankful that I've had guys like this that have spoken into my life over the years. And so this is why it's super important to surround ourselves with people like this. And so we see this in this passage that, um, that Solomon had this drift. And so this is what happens in verse nine. It says, the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. And although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, since this is your attitude and you have, you have not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. So what do we see here? We see sometimes our drifting has dire consequences. And folks, this is like really important. A life of drifting will have eternal consequences. Like our lives should not be characterized by drifting away from God and idol worship until we die. That will lead us into eternity separated from God. And this is why this is so dangerous. So God can still love us and he can be for us, but he's also going to be disciplining us as sons and daughters. A great portion of the Bible is written about warning. The entire book of Hebrews is like one giant warning to, to the Christians of that day to finish well and to finish all the way to the end. And so we need to, be, we need to realize as believers in Jesus that we are capable of doing a whole lot of damage by drifting. And there can be dire consequences. We can blow up our marriages. We can cheat on our spouses. We can abuse children. We can go to jail. We can forfeit opportunities to get married and every other evil under the sun. And how did we get there? By drifting and compromising. Because why? Because we drift by default. I guarantee you Solomon just didn't arrive there one day. This was like many, many little decisions over time. I don't think he could marry all thousand women on the same day. So this was probably a continual thing. Drift, 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 drift. And before you know, he got a thousand wives. And so we find out later in these chapters that God, as a result, he sends trouble to Solomon. He sends guys like Hadad and Razan and this guy named Jeroboam. And these guys rise up against Solomon. Why? Because God loves Solomon. He doesn't want him to continue in this. And sometimes he brings adversity into, into his life because of this stuff. And Jeroboam was one of Solomon's officials, and he rebels against him and causes the kingdom of Israel to split into two, to split into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And so maybe when we go further in our series, you'll hear this name Jeroboam again, and you'll understand like, oh yeah, this is the guy that rose up against Solomon because of Solomon's idol worship. So this is why this is so serious. We do not want to drift away from the Lord. 
So, okay, so how do we know if we're drifting? How do we know? Well, if you think back to the beginning when we we're talking about this idea of being in the ocean, I know like for me, sometimes when I was out there floating around, sometimes I'd anchor to my family, but there was like thousands of people all over the beach. But there are other times I'm like, hey, there's a building. And I would anchor myself to a building. I'm like, I know where that building is, then I know where I'm at. And so when we think about this, being moored in the right, uh, by the right idea is, is by knowing Christ through his word. We need to be anchored down to knowing Christ through the Bible. And so what does that mean for us? It means this. We need to be in his word on a consistent basis. So how do you know if you're drifting? If you're not in the word of God on a consistent basis, I can tell you now, 100%, you're drifting. Why? Because we all drift by default. It's just what happens. It's not because you're a bad person. It's just because this is the way things go. We will drift by doing nothing. So if the word of God is not in your heart on a consistent basis, you are drifting. When we have the word of God in our hearts, great. That's awesome. But part of us having the word of God in our hearts, it needs to be doing something for us. It needs to be challenging us. It needs to be admonishing us. It needs to be a double-edged sword. This is what we see in the book of Hebrews. It says the word of God is alive and active and is sharper than a double-edged sword. That means by reading the Bible and asking God to teach us, it should be having an impact on us. And the Holy Spirit will use the truths of Scripture to bring conviction and challenge to us. And so my question to you is, as you're spending time with God or as you're opening His Word, what's He trying to do in your life? How's He trying to make you more like Jesus? Paul says, in the book of Timothy, he says, all scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Rebuking, correcting, and training sound like things that are hard on people. They sound like work. And so this is what the word of God should do in our lives. It should be bringing some sense of challenge and conviction. How else do we know if we're drifting? Does our life represent the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. People should be able to see this in our lives. It's not going to be perfect because we have indwelling sin. We're going to continue to walk away from God at different times in our life. We're going to have struggles. But there should be a sense that we are growing in these things. When you look back in your life a month ago, three months ago, a year ago, are you the same person? We shouldn't be the same people. We, there should be a sense of growing in our godliness in these areas. How else, could we, how else could we know if we're drifting? Are you loving God and people well? What do people around you say? Are they experiencing the love of Jesus when they're close to you? Or are they experiencing kind of like a pre-converted version of yourself? I know if my wife says to me, like, you're just kind of cranky these days. Like, that's telling me I'm drifting. And she has said that. Uh, on multiple occasions, and I'm like, that's drift. Um, the people around us should be experiencing somehow the love of Jesus. What else? How about a devoted prayer life? There should be some sense that we're listening to God, that we're ask, not just asking him for things, not using him as a vending machine or Santa Claus, but that we're actually trying to like listen to him on a regular basis. So are we, say, are we seeking him in prayer? Are we gathering around other believers on a regular basis? Or are we isolated? If we are isolated, we are drifting. Because the Christian life is not a solo thing, it's a corporate thing. There should be people around us that are helping us and propelling us along. So, is all hope lost if we're kind of struggling like this, and we read this read this last chapter of 1 Kings, like, oh no, Solomon just messed up his whole life, is all Hope lost? No, all hope is not lost. Even though Solomon had problems, we never see that God abandoned him or withdrew his love for him. We saw that God disciplined him. And hope is not lost when God disciplines us. There's other, another thing that I thought was really interesting when we were kind of looking at Solomon. You see over and over again his father David being mentioned. And what's the phrase you see over and over again? You see this idea that Solomon didn't follow me as David did 
because David had a heart that was for the Lord. He didn't follow the Lord completely as David did. He didn't keep his decrees and laws as David did. And so like, it would lead us to believe like, oh, okay, so David just got everything right. He did everything right. No, we, we know that. We know from David's life that all the things I mentioned in the beginning that he did. So why in the world would God speak past tense of this after David did all these things? Why would God say, David's a man after my own heart, after he did all these horrible things? And there is a big difference between Solomon and David that we notice. David had a heart of repentance. If you look at Psalm 51, Psalm 51 is a great uh, psalm about David after he had committed adultery of Bathsheba. And you see these ideas like, have mercy on me, O God. I know my transgression and my sins always before you. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what's, what's evil in your sight. There's complete ownership of sin. There's a sense of, of repentance and remorse. And this is a difference between David and Solomon. As far as I could find, looking up all the different things about Solomon, I cannot find any examples in, in the Bible of Solomon having that kind of repentant, remorseful heart. You see in the end of Ecclesiastes, he's kind of coming around okay, but not like David. And this is the difference between David and Solomon. And here's another interesting thing. How do you think David got to where he got to? He had guys like Nathan in his life who came and spoke into his life and told him like, dude, you totally screwed up with what you did with Bathsheba. And David listened to this guy. David could have easily had Nathan killed in that moment. Said, who are you to talk to me like this? But, it, but David had something in his heart that was like tender and soft towards, towards the things of God. And he knew that Nathan was right. And David had a guy in his life that spoke this truth to him. And I can't imagine that that didn't have a profound impact on his life. And not only that, but David had a willingness to listen to that kind of correction in his life. So the Christian life is not about trying to rid all sin out of our lives. We can't do that. We have indwelling sin that's not going to go away perfectly. But the Christian life is about the presence of consistent repentance and faith day after day until we die. The Christian life is not about the absence of sin, but the presence of consistent repentance and faith until we die. Jesus came because he knew that we couldn't prevent our drifting by our own work, by our own strength, by our own um, just force. He knew we couldn't do it, but he came, he sacrificed himself, he knew we would be lame followers and he provided a way in which we could be made right by God and with God by believing in him and placing our faith in him. So all hope is not lost because Jesus came and he knew we would drift and he knew that we needed help with this. And as we drift, he's right there to get us back on track again and to help get us um, following him again through repentance. So here's, here's my final challenge, and we're done. If, if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, and you just, you just know that, I've never done that, I don't know anything about that, or I've never decided to do that, you need to make that decision to follow him and make him Lord of your life now. None of us are guaranteed anything after this moment, and so it would be a terrible thing to fall into the hands of an angry God who is going to ask us to pay our own sin debt. And so you can come to Jesus just exactly as you are, not fixing your life up. Come as you are and say, Jesus, I have never made you Lord of my life. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm messed up. I can't do this on my own. And I ask you to be Lord of my life. You can do that today. And if you have made that commitment to Jesus, but you're like, I know I'm drifting. I just know it. I haven't been spending time with God. I know I'm making decisions that are idolatrous. I know I don't get up every morning and think about how am I following Jesus. I'm trying to follow and love something else. There's great news for you and I as well. We can repent. And we can do, we can follow David's example. Lord, I need your help. I haven't been following you. And he will gladly bring you back in and get you on the right path again because he loves you as a father 
loves his children. And so don't delay in that as well. And I appreciate you being here with us today. God bless. Thanks so much again for joining us this week. A quick reminder, um, if you are new to United or you've never been to Starting Point before, go ahead and sign up for that um, when you check in and we will see you on April 20th at 6.30 for that dinner. Um, otherwise, we'll see you next week. Thanks.